They say Lake Superior never gives up her dead. The largest of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior spans over 31,000 square miles and holds 2,900 cubic miles of water, making it the largest freshwater lake in the world by surface area and the third largest by volume. Its size and geographic location make Lake Superior a critical transportation route that has fueled economic growth in both the United States and Canada. The lake is unusually cold, with water temperatures that hover only just above freezing for most of the year. At higher temperatures, bacteria creates gases that will lift a decaying body to the water's surface. But because the water in Lake Superior is so cold, natural decay is inhibited, and bodies sink to the bottom, never to resurface. Lake Superior truly never gives up her dead. This is why, with so many Lake Superior shipwrecks, vessels vanish without a trace, and none of their crew are ever found, leaving lasting mysteries that intrigue and unsettle, inspiring stories, songs, and speculation. Here are three lesser-known stories of ships that mysteriously vanished on Lake Superior. In 1855, the Sioux locks were opened, connecting Lake Superior with the Lower Great Lakes. This major feat of engineering allowed shipping to flourish, as raw materials could now be easily transported throughout the region. For the next two decades, the lakes were dominated by sailing vessels that grew larger and more advanced with each ship. But steam was quickly gaining in popularity. While less graceful than their sailing predecessors, Steamships were faster and easier to maneuver in tight waterways. They also didn't have to be towed through canals. This all made it easier to deliver valuable cargoes on a regular schedule. The eventual dominance of steam on the lakes was inevitable. The Manistee was a typical example of one of these early Great Lake steamers. Designed to carry both passengers and freight, she was built in 1867 by E.M. Peck in Cleveland for the Engelman Line based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At launch, she measured 184 feet or 56 meters in length and came in at 677 tons. While she was far from the most luxurious steamer on the lakes, her accommodations were somewhat standard for the time. She originally operated on Lake Michigan between Milwaukee and Manistee, Michigan, but this route quickly proved unprofitable and she traded Manistee for Grand Haven. In 1871, the steamer was cut in half and an additional 30 feet in length were added. Business on the new route also proved unsuccessful, and in 1872, she was purchased by the Ward Line and brought to Lake Superior, where she would offer significantly longer voyages between Duluth, Minnesota and Buffalo, New York. In 1876, the steamer was purchased by the Leopold and Austrian Line and began operating between Duluth and Prince Arthur's Landing which is now Thunder Bay, Ontario. Throughout her years of service, the Manistee was run hard by all of her owners. She operated year-round, and one winter she got stuck in an ice field for 58 days. By the end of the 1870s, the wooden steamer was showing her age and facing harsh criticism from inspectors. She was withdrawn from service in 1879 and underwent a significant refit at the Randon Burgers shipyard. The work was overseen by her longtime captain, John McKay. She re-entered service in 1881, but it was quickly discovered that her concave sides leaked substantially when she was fully loaded. Almost immediately, she was again withdrawn from service, and her sides were ripped off and replaced with new framing and planks. After a thorough inspection, the Manistee, now really almost completely rebuilt, was given an A2 rating, the highest possible score for a vessel of her age. In the fall of 1882, another leak was discovered in the water bottom of her boiler. This too was replaced, and she served for the next year without major incident. By November of 1883, Captain McKay was deeply confident in his ship, but he also knew her limitations extremely well. On Saturday, November 10, 1883, the Manistee left Duluth with a handful of passengers and 400 tons of cargo that included flour, mill goods, furniture, and other general merchandise, bound for Ontonagon, Michigan. Almost immediately after the Manistee departed, 
a major storm swept over Lake Superior. On Sunday morning, the Manistee arrived in Bayfield, Wisconsin, where she sheltered from the storm. Over the course of five days, Captain McKay attempted to leave during periods where it seemed that the storm was easing. But each time, conditions quickly reversed, and McKay was forced to return. Several other ships, including the steamer City of Duluth and China, also sheltered in Bayfield. While they waited out the storm, several of the Manistee's passengers transferred to the City of Duluth likely because of the better accommodations available on the newer and larger steamship. But maybe there was something about the Manistee that gave these lucky passengers reservations. By the evening of Thursday, November 15th, the storm seemed to ease, and at 8.40 p.m., Captain McKay decided it was safe enough to continue their journey to Ontonagon just 75 miles away. At 10 p.m., both the city of Duluth and the China also departed Bayfield and followed the same route. Upon reaching their destination in Portage, the two steamers reported the Manistee's departure only a few hours before their own. But the Manistee failed to arrive in Ontonagon, and by Monday morning, concern began to mount. On Monday night, the tug Matham was sent to search for the missing steamer. Soon, another tug called the Boynton joined the search, and a call was put out to other vessels in the area to keep an eye out for traces of the Manistee but only a few pieces of wreckage were ever found. The most substantial was a portion of her pilot house discovered by the Matham. Other pieces of debris, including oars, a yawl boat, barrels, and pieces of her nameplate washed up on Keweenaw beaches over the next days and weeks. But no bodies were ever found, and her wreck has never been located, though it's believed that she went down somewhere near the Apostle Islands, not long after leaving Bayfield. Both the city of Duluth and China reported facing difficult weather as fragments of the storm lingered over Lake Superior. But these vessels fared quite well. Some believe that the Manistee, leaving a bit earlier, sailed into a lingering isolated squall that she couldn't survive. Others believe the Manistee's refurbishment was botched and rotten timbers were left in place, making the aging steamer vulnerable to the harsh November gale. But in the immediate aftermath of her disappearance, many were quick to defend the condition of the ship and the skill of Captain McKay. It's believed that there were around 19 crew members and at least four passengers on the Manistee that night. But records from the time were spotty, and it's possible that more could have been lost to Lake Superior on the night of November 15, 1883. Without a wreck and only a few traces of debris, what exactly happened to the Manistee? will remain a mystery. If you've been following this channel for a while, you know how much I love nature. I was lucky enough to grow up in the Pacific Northwest, and some of my fondest memories come from exploring the mountains, forests, and beaches in my home state of Oregon. Life has taken me to the other side of the country, but I'm always looking for things that I can carry with me that remind me of where I came from. That's why I'm excited to be working with Holskern for this video. Holskern is a small family business based in Austria that creates beautiful watches, jewelry, sunglasses, and more, all inspired by nature. Holskern means wood core in German, and all of their products incorporate natural materials like wood, stone, mother of pearl, or even meteorites. These natural grains and marbling create truly unique and stunning pieces. I picked out their existential watch, made from marble and gold stainless steel, with a black leather band because the natural look of the grey marble was like no other watch I'd ever seen. It immediately reminded me of the mountains of Oregon, and I'm absolutely in love with how beautiful it is. To complement my new watch, I picked out their scholar necklace, which uses similar marble and gold materials. I'm a pretty casual person, but I appreciate any opportunity to add a bit of refinement to my look. Holskern watches and jewelry fit that perfectly. They have a huge number of watches and jewelry to choose from. I bet you can find something that matches what you love too. Check them out with the link below and be sure to use the code BIGOLDBOATS15 at checkout to get 15% off. Thank you so much to Holskern for sponsoring this video. I absolutely love their products and I'm sure you will too. Now, back to the Great Lakes. Just four years after the loss of the Manistee, one of the first steel-hulled lake freighters, the SS Ira H. Owen, 
was launched for the Owen line in 1887. While the SS Merchant, built in 1862, was the first iron-hulled merchant ship built on the Great Lakes, wooden hulls remained popular well into the 1880s due to their lower cost and the abundance of timber in the region. Built at the Globe Iron Works Company in Cleveland, Ohio, the Ira H. Owen was the company's fourth steel hulled vessel. Designed to carry iron ore, the freighter measured 278.3 feet or 84.4 meters in length with a beam of 39 feet or 12 meters. She came in at 1,753 tons and had a cargo capacity of 2,900 tons. Her steam was provided by two Scotch marine boilers that powered a single double cylinder fore and aft compound steam engine. Her original configuration sported three masts and a unique two funnel design. Throughout her career, the Ira H. Owen was involved in multiple accidents and collisions many of which nearly doomed the unlucky freighter. She ran aground at least twice not long after entering service, once in the St. Clair River and again near the Sioux Locks. On June 16, 1892, she collided with a two-masted schooner called the Belle Brown, severely damaging both vessels. On July 2, 1893, she struck a rock off Cedar Point and had to be beached to prevent her from sinking. Then, on July 20, 1897, she collided with the freighter Susquehanna, again severely damaging both vessels. On December 30th, 1899, she was sold to the National Steamship Company, based out of Ohio, and underwent a major refit that removed one of her three masts. Under her new owners, she was used to carry both coal and grain. Her misfortune continued on December 5th, 1903, when a fire broke out in her boiler room while she was transporting a load of grain bound for Buffalo, New York. The fire quickly raged out of control. Her crew tried to beach her, but they failed. As the flames spread, they prepared to abandon the ship. But just when hope seemed lost, the car ferry Ann Arbor No. 1 appeared on the scene after hearing her distress calls. They soon established a tow line, and crews continued to fight the fire as the Ann Arbor towed her to the Sturgeon Bay Ship Canal, where the Owen finally sank in 20 feet of water. The ship suffered significant damage but she was repaired and soon returned to service. And if all that wasn't enough, she collided with the ore carrier Henry W. Oliver in the St. Mary's River on October 13, 1904. She suffered significant damage and had to be beached, but once again, she was refloated, repaired, and returned to service. The Ira H. Owen either had terrible luck or great luck, depending on how you look at her many brushes with death. But by November 1905, her luck was finally running out. Her regular captain, Joseph Holligan, had fallen ill, and her first mate, Thomas Honor, was promoted to captain for this voyage to take his place. Holligan remained on board when she left Duluth on the morning of November 28th, with a light load of barley bound for Buffalo. By the time she passed the Apostle Islands, the weather was quickly deteriorating as a November gale swept over Lake Superior. While Captain Honor could have sought shelter, he instead decided to continue the voyage. He was perhaps trying to prove himself in his new role, or maybe he just misjudged the severity of the oncoming storm. In either case, the Ira H. Owen was soon fighting for her life as she passed Outer Island facing 80 to 90 mile per hour winds and massive swells. The gale would go down in history as the Matafa storm, named after another famous victim, the SS Matafa. Early that evening, Captain Alva Keller of the freighter Harold B. Nye heard a distress signal billowing in the whiteout. He scanned the horizon and soon spotted the mass of the Ira H. Owen struggling in the heavy swells, blowing a continuous distress signal. The storm prevented Captain Keller from reaching the distressed freighter, and she soon disappeared in the blizzard. When the storm eased a few hours later, he searched for his fellow mariners, but the ship was nowhere to be found. The fate of the Ira H. Owen was confirmed on the morning of December 1st, when Captain M. K. Chamberlain of the freighter Sir William Siemens discovered a small debris field 12 miles east of Michigan Island. They found chairs, pieces of her superstructure, and a handful of life jackets that bore the name Ira H. Owen. 
none of the freighter's 19 crew members were ever found. She was the only ship claimed by the Matafa storm that was lost with all hands. It's believed that she went down somewhere near Outer Island in the Apostles, but as of the date of this video, her wreck has never been found. The details of her final moments are forever lost to Lake Superior. While fought thousands of miles away, World War I would lead to one of the strangest mysteries in the history of the Great Lakes. With shipyards in Europe either stretched far beyond capacity or out of commission entirely, space in North American shipyards was in high demand, and most shifted their output to building vessels for the war. One of these shipyards, the Canadian Car and Foundry Company in Fort William, Ontario, was contracted by the French Navy to build 12 nearly identical minesweepers. These ships displaced 630 tons and measured 140 feet or 43 meters in length, with a beam of 22 and a half feet or just under seven meters. They were designed with four watertight compartments and fitted with twin screws that achieved a speed of around 12 knots. They were armed with two four inch guns installed on their decks forward and aft and equipped with wireless radio sets. War constraints meant that these ships were of simple construction and assembled quickly. They were designed to easily convert into fishing trawlers after the war. On the morning of Saturday, November 23, 1918, three of these newly completed minesweepers, the Inkerman, the Sarisol, and the Sebastopol, all named after major battles of the Crimean and Italian wars, left Fort William each with a crew of 38 French sailors. They were headed for the Atlantic via the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River, despite entering service only days after the armistice. The Inkerman was commanded by Captain Mizeau, the Sarisau by Captain Dode, and the Sebastopol by Captain Leclerc, who was also charged with leading the three ships. Each ship also had an experienced Canadian pilot to help guide them through the Great Lakes. Captain R. Wilson joined the Inkerman, and Captain W. J. Murphy joined the Sarisol. On November 24th, the trio were overtaken by a fierce November gale. Captain Leclerc of the Sebastopol could barely believe the severity of the storm as it ripped into his brand new ship. They sailed into the screaming southwest winds until they reached Keweenaw Point, where they were forced to make a tricky turn northwest. The helmsman could hardly control the ship as she was battered by massive waves that sent green water pouring over her bow. Several seams broke open, partially flooding her engine rooms. They had to run the pumps constantly to keep water from reaching her boilers and crippling the engines. Debris sloshed around all over the ship, making movement difficult. The situation was so dire that the crew donned their life jackets and the lifeboats were prepared. The young, inexperienced, and mostly seasick crew was convinced that they would be forced to abandon the ship at any moment. They were sure that they were soon going to die. Somewhere in the maelstrom, the Sebastopol lost sight of the Inkerman and the Sarisol. Through skill, or maybe just dumb luck, the Sebastopol managed to complete their turn, and two days later, she arrived at the Sioux Locks on the other end of Lake Superior, fighting the storm the entire way. Captain Leclerc assumed the two other ships were just behind them, perhaps delayed after seeking shelter from the storm. The Sebastopol continued on to Kingston, Ontario, where she paused to wait for her fleetmates. But the Inkerman and the Sarisol never arrived. Some held out hope that the other two ships slipped through the locks in the storm and were already on their way to the St. Lawrence River. But this was wishful thinking. Due to wartime censorship, the disappearance of the ships was kept secret, and the search effort, which didn't begin until December 3rd, was small and hidden from the general public. Captain Leleu soon returned to the area to personally oversee the search. The tugboat Frank Weston was chartered to cover the area where the Sebastopol lost sight of the other two ships, but little was found. Only some freshly painted wood splinters and a new unmarked life ring was discovered in the search area. In total, the incident claimed 78 lives, the largest loss of life of any Lake Superior shipwreck. Not a single one of the bodies 
was ever found. What exactly happened to the Inkerman and the Cerisol remains a mystery. Captain Leleur believed that the two ships were overtaken by the storm not long after he lost sight of them. Their end was likely quick, giving the crew no time to abandon the small ships. It's possible they capsized, trapping their men as they plunged to the bottom. When news of the loss finally became public, many believed that the shipyard cut corners when building the ships due to wartime pressures that limited time and materials. But others doubt this explanation. Twelve identical ships were constructed. Of the twelve, all but the Inkerman and the Sarasol served until the 1930s, and four served until the 1950s, with the Molokov remaining in service until 1974. This suggests that the loss was due to the overwhelming force of the storm, not some defect in the ships. Lake Superior has claimed many vessels that were significantly larger and more advanced. Others have pointed to the inexperience of the crews, many of which have never been to sea before. Their radio operators were said to actually be students, who might have struggled to understand the equipment or send a message in such a challenging situation. That could explain why no distress signal was ever sent. But this could also be explained by a quick sinking. Today, the Inkerman and the Sarasol, partially due to wartime secrecy and their foreign crews, are largely forgotten, easily overshadowed by more famous Lake Superior disasters. To this day, their wrecks have never been found. While the ships in these three stories couldn't be any more different, their disappearances are strikingly similar. All were lost in November storms. Not a single body from any of these ships was ever found, and their wrecks all remain undiscovered. Their graves, somewhere on the floor of Lake Superior, remain undisturbed. Their stories left incomplete, frozen in time, and lost to history. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and help out the channel with a like and comment. I'd love to hear what you think about these lesser known Great Lakes stories. And subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. Thank you again to Holskern for sponsoring this video. Check them out using the link below and be sure to use the code BIGOLDBOATS15 at checkout for 15% off. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. I heard they just won Wimbledon. That's pretty nifty. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.